Good morning, brothers and sisters. Thank you for the privilege of sharing with you. I want to thank the Reverend Nugent and the East Green Street Baptist Church for giving me this opportunity to share with you as the matter of the church and the church image in this dispensation has been a concern on my heart in terms of what the church is and what the church is becoming in this season. And, and I want to draw our attention to a passage of scripture found in Philippi, the book of Philippians chapter two, five through eight. Philippians chapter two, five through eight. And it reads, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The letter to the brethren in Philippi was necessitated by the structure of the church in Philippi that was made up of Jews and Gentiles coming together to form the congregation in Philippi. Two different sets of people from two different backgrounds coexisting together as a church, as a church community. One religiously strict, the other, the apostle would describe throughout the book of Philippians as having free or loose morals from a background that saw them giving themselves over to all kind of self-extended pleasure and, and, and deformity. And these two totally different ethical, religious, and moral sets of people seeking to form a very stable union and unit in the church became a matter of concern. And the, the apostle wrote the church to live together in the bond of unity necessitated through the spirit in the bond of peace. This was a request that almost seemed impossible. If you could not even get the Jews to live together in unity and harmony, how are you going to get Jews and Gentiles to know foster a bond beyond their human ability? The apostle believed that this was possible. And out of his letter to the church at Philippi comes a message to the church that says to the church, look at your image of who God wants you to be as a church, conforming to that image. And through that understanding, we can be once again light in a darkened world hope for what appears to be a hopeless system. The truth is, we must be careful of the image we take onto ourselves as church. For so much these days are hinged on the world's view of what the church should be. And I want to suggest that any self-image created by a broken world can only be as broken as the world that creates it. Any image 
of the church created or fostered out of a broken world. That image can only be as broken as the world that tried to craft that image for the church. So then if we are going to be looking during this period of fasting as fostering every area righteously, nurturing the church back to health, how do we begin with an understanding of who we are and what we are supposed to be in God? What is the image we have when we talk about the church, the, the body of Christ? Because if we don't agitate this image carefully in prayer, reflection and meditation, meditation we may be operating under a flawed concept of what the church should be. So the apostle invites us to see the image of the church in the very image of Christ when he calls the Philippians church in Philippians 2, 5 through 8 to say, have this attitude in yourself, which also is in Christ Jesus who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bond servant and be, be, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I, I mean, the, the image there is beautiful. Let this mind, King James says, or let this attitude be in us that was first manifested in Christ Jesus. The Greek word used for emptied himself in the passage is one that conveys not giving up of some things, but pouring out himself into something of lesser importance. When you look at the passage, you see that the Lord emptied himself, not of anything, but into something. He emptied himself, taking on the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. In order for God in Christ to serve the world, minister to the world, bring about transformation in the world. He emptied himself into the image, the, 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 the mold of a servant. What is so beautiful about this portrayal is twofold. He did not just empty himself in the form of a human or becoming human in the incarnation but he became the lesser form of human expression that existed in the world, servant, slave. So even though he condescended to being human, he condescended further to being slave, servant. And this is important because the self-emptying of Christ preceded the self-sacrifice of Christ on Calvary. He emptied himself before he gave himself to be crucified. And this is essential because without self-emptying, attaining authentic self-sacrificial living is impossible. If the church does not practice to empty itself individually and collectively into the form of that God is expecting the church should come, be, be conformed to, then there is no way we can serve faithfully through self-sacrificial living. You see, self-sacrifice can become a mask to conceal self-ambition or selfish motives. One can sacrifice something of lesser importance to the self for something of a greater importance, greater self-fulfillment and selfish objective. Self-sacrifice then 
does not remove selfishness from the equation. Because we can always sacrifice sleep in order to pass an exam so that we can boost ourselves to get more money. Not for the sake of honoring God, but for the sake of self-exaltation. Self-sacrifice does not of itself free us from operating with selfish concerns. You see, self-emptying is about the personal freedom from selfish concerns characterized by selflessness. That self-emptying, freeing oneself of being overly concerned about the self or, or preserving the self or advancing the self, characterized by selflessness. It is an abandonment of the overwhelming need to prioritize the self. While self-sacrifice is the giving up of one's interest or wishes in order to help others or advance a cause. Self-sacrifice does not free us, as I said, from selfish concern. It's being selective about which concern to prioritize and for what objective. What to give up in order to progress or to persevere or to advance. And if we are selective in what to give up in order to get something else, it still leaves us bound to be very, very selfish and self-absorbed. If we are going to fortify every area righteously, fear, then we need to begin to prioritize self-emptying over self-sacrifice. You see, the Lord says, if anyone come after me, they must first deny themselves. This is self-emptying. Then take up your cross, self-sacrifice, and follow me. Self-emptying must precede self-sacrifice. If we are going to sacrifice anything at all for the cause of Christ, we must first learn to empty ourselves. You see, there are two examples the apostle presented in, in the passage here. One of two ladies found in Philippians 4, 2 through 9. Two prominent ladies in the church. And I'm going to leave you to try to pronounce the two names by yourselves. But you can read that portion of the letter. These two ladies, the apostle noted, had a disagreement. And a disagreement that does not seem to have been able to resolve itself at the time of the writing of the letter. You see, he was writing from prison in Rome sending the letter to Timothy and Epaphroditus to the Philippians church. And he noted that the concerns of the disagreement between these two women had reached his ears. But what is interesting is that the, ap the apostle didn't look at the disagreement as some major he did not see the heresy the, the disagreement as heresy or false doctrine or a matter of disagreement based on false interpretation of scripture no no he did not see their disagreement as ethical or moral failing it, it wasn't that these women were, were sinful in their exercise within the church or disruptive in their moral soundness. He didn't even see the disagreement as 
any kind of a fight for position in the church. It, it wasn't any ecclesiastical dysfunctionality. No. Because the way the apostle mentioned these two women in verse 3 of chapter 4, he thought, he, he thought highly of them. These women were women who impacted his ministry and himself and other saints who served the gospel. Personally, they benefited him, but collectively, they were stalwarts of the Christian faith. So their disagreements were not profoundly heretic or immoral or fighting for position. What it appears to be is that their disagreement was personal bias or preferences. Something that was personal interest to either of them. So he asked for the assistance of the church to come to their aid and help these women settle the disagreement. In this, the apostle was saying, this is what happened when we don't empty ourselves as believers in the church. We position our preference and our peculiarities are so important that we prioritize getting our own way over advancing the health of the church. We push our own personal preference at the expense of unity and harmony in the church. So if my song is not sung on a Sunday, my, my voice is not heard in the prayers, or I am not lifted up as important and recognized in the congregation, then I am not comfortable. My personal interest must be celebrated and, 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 and advanced even above everybody else if we are going to nurture the church back to health we need to be able to empty ourselves become selfless in our approach to the gospel and to christian living so much so that we prioritize each other even more so than we prioritize ourselves. You see, the conflict based on the apostles' call for self-emptying, pattern after the self-emptying of Christ, suggests one of pride, self-importance, and personal preference. He did not point out any one of the females as being in the wrong, but implied an unwillingness on the part of both to choose humility for the sake of harmony. To choose humility for the sake of resolution. He appealed to the congregation to intervene as a matter of importance because this local matter had reached his ears in prison all the way in Rome. And therefore, it was escalating to the point of being disruptive, even though it seemed to have been personal matters. So we need to be careful. If we are going to nurture the church back through the spirit to a place of health and healing and wholeness, each member must practice self-emptying. Is each member guided by the spirit, must pour himself or herself out at the altar of humility, serving a cause greater than the self-interest. But you see, the apostle pivoted from the example that negatively reflects self-emptying to an image that positively reflect self-emptying. When you look at um, the apostle portrayal in chapter two of Timothy, 
you find the apostle highlighting Timothy and his brother in the faith, Epaphroditus, as an example for which the church need to pattern what self-emptying look like, looked like. He says about Timothy in the passage, and I love the fact that you read from Timothy this morning. He says about Timothy that Timothy demonstrated the kind of character that could only be identified in verse 19 and 20. A deep concern for the brethren. A concern, the apostle says, captures the very concern on his own heart. He noted that Timothy was willing to drop all his personal concerns in order to bring the letter from Rome all the way to Philippi to help the church deal with the conflict. Timothy had prioritized the brethren in Philippi above and beyond his own immediate needs and concerns. Timothy lay aside his concerns for himself and for what he was doing to prioritize the brethren at Philippi. He said in the letter to Philippi, embrace Timothy because he is one of the few servants I found to have the interest of the church and the interest of God in Christ to heart. The others, the others are too wrapped up with personal concerns to prioritize the saints and the work of Christ. And it seems as if if we're not careful, Christian service becomes personal stepping stone to self-gratification. And we don't practice emptying ourselves for the cause of Christ. You see, if we are going to bring about through the spirit, the recovery of the church to a place of healing and wholeness and unity, then what we need to conform to is an image of servanthood that is liberated from servitude. Because you are servant to Christ, you are not slave to each member. You are slave to Christ, and through Christ, you serve the church. Here is the beautiful part I want to leave with us, brothers and sisters. If we are going to be servants, we can't be servants who reach down and help the fallen up. Because we would be looking down on the fallen and offering the fallen our strength and our prowess. And when the work is done, we have all but to celebrate and say to each other, if it wasn't for me, you would never have reached where you are. The Apostle Paul said, that is not the image of the church and servants, servanthood that I want you to adopt. I want you to adopt an image that humbles yourself below the fallen so you can push the fallen up. Humble yourself before the broken so you can lift the broken up. The position of servanthood must locate itself below the least among us so that we can take them from below where they are and push them from above where we are. In this image of servanthood, in this image of humility, those who must be lifted are assisted with some of our strength, but they are able under God to use some of their strength to push themselves up as they are guided by the Spirit. So help 
becomes a joint sharing of strength. We who are called to help the church back to wholeness are called to partner with each other in humility, lifting each other up so that we understand, we prioritize each other above the self. If we don't adopt this posture, then we cannot help the church become whole, become healthy, and become united because we will be too busy seeking our own interests. I charge us this morning that as we enter this fasting, are you humbling yourself? Not just to lift each other up, but to position yourself below where the least of us are to lift us, push us, and exalt us beyond ourselves. Prioritizing each other. When you read, and I invite you to go back and read the passage, Philippians chapter 2, mm -hmm. and you will see the apostles saying to the church, learn how to adopt this mindset, this persona, this image of humility, in and through Christ that offers itself completely without reservation and ha will have no limit to its sacrificial offering, even to the death of the cross. When we humble ourselves, we should serve each other. No matter what it costs, no matter what it requires, because in mm -hmm. doing so, we are conforming to the image of service that God in Christ took on when he said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. I pray that we re-examine the image we have of ourselves in the church and the image we have of the church on a whole. Is the church conforming to the image of service and servanthood that Christ portrayed ultimately in his sacrifice on Calvary? Are we emptying ourselves the way Christ emptied himself into a form that captures beautifully what totality of service should be? And have we even started serving if we have not yet learned to empty ourselves of selfish motives and concern towards selfless abandonment so that Christ can use us without arrogance, without pride, without deceit, without self-interest. My prayer for us is that Lord, if I ask for things that I should not ask for, if I seek for myself and not for my neighbors, take these chains from my heart and set me free. Let us quiet our hearts in prayer. Father, our Lord, our King, our all in all, we come to you this morning. Recognize, you know, God, that we have picked up and learned some ways and qualities which, God, we have sometimes unintentionally imposed within and on the church as the ideal persona for Christian living and Christian life. But, Lord, we come asking you to help us to empty ourselves for lord until we can pour out ourselves completely into the form and image and character you want us to be we cannot authentically offer service within your church and lord 
any image we adopt that is not first grounded in you can only be as broken as the mind and heart that created it. Lord, we pray, break us into the mold of humility. Break us into the structure of the servant you would want us to be individual and collectively as a church. For Lord, service is more than just the programs we, we present and we come up with. It's more than just the activities we do. It is conforming to who you want us to be. So Lord, if there's any hindrance, Remove the scales from our eyes and from our hearts. Pull back the curtains of our own blindness and give us a glimpse of what you want us to be. So that we will be submitted and submissive to your Holy Spirit. Lord, as this fasting continues, shape us. Free us from ourselves and our selfish, selfish ways to who you are and who you want us to be. For Lord, the light that the world should be seeing in the church is growing too dim, too hidden. Oh Lord, we need that light to be bright and shining again so that the world will see you as the hope that is needed and turn to you. Lord, take that which we offer to you as a surrendered heart, as a committed expression of our devotion to you, as we tell you thanks, O oh God, for what you have called us into and what you will be unfolding to us as we give ourselves to this process. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.